Welcome to Game of Thrones Abridged, episode 109. On this program, we discuss the Song of Ice and Fire book series by George R. R. Martin, and we do it chapter by chapter, line by line, word by word, diphthong by diphthong. Let no diphthong be untouched by the Schwiftmeister. Today, we are discussing the 36th chapter in the second book, A Clash of Kings. And so those those kings, they be clashing in the south. You got Renly and Stannis and Joffrey all running around, but there is a, and there is a saltier, damper king lurking in the form of Balon Greyjoy from the Iron Islands. Uh, so, you know, that's that's all going on in the south, while in the north, Bran is the Stark of Winterfell. This poor nine-year-old boy with his broken body is the Stark of Winterfell. And he's not got the best support network because Ned has been killed in the south. Catelyn is down south with Rob. All of the strength, the soldiers, armies of the north have gone south with Rob, leaving not a lot to support Bran in Winterfell. He's got Maester Lewin, uh, he's got Osha, he's got Hodor, he's got Jojen and Mira, he's got his little brother, he's got big Walder Frey and little Walder Frey, uh, and with the, with those assets he is trying to hold things together in the north, because with Rob and everyone gone, uh, opportunists are trying to grab land in the north. You've got like Ramsay Bolton and Wyman Manderley both trying to take over the Hornwood lands. And so all, all these like political issues start encroaching on, on Bran in Winterfell. While at the same time, Bran is undergoing this metaphysical spiritual crisis where he's getting these dreams from the three-eyed crow and he's psychically connected to his wolf and Jojen is giving him these prophecies of, of future doom so he's got to grapple with all of that stuff while at the same time you know he's a he's a nine-year-old boy and he's trying to look after his four-year-old brother Rickon who's so sad that he's family has disappeared and he's you know making friends with with Jojen and Mira and making enemies with Big Walder and Little Walder so there's a whole lot going on um and it's exciting let me know what the quality of this stream is let me know if there's buffering um actually yeah I might I might go and fix that super quickly uh stream yeah, okay. All right, let's continue and ignore computers. Computers are annoying. Okay, so let's discuss this chapter bit by bit. What's going on with old Brano? So the first line is, Alebelly found him in the forge, working the bellows for Micken. Which right away is adorable, right? Like this nine-year-old boy, this, this prince of Winterfell, is hanging out in the forge helping Micken working the bellows, which I can't imagine that Bran is very good or useful at working the bellows. I mean, he's a he's a nine-year-old boy. Doesn't it take a bit of upper body strength to work the, the bellows in a forge? I don't know. But, like, the point is that Bran is, is helping. And, you know, unlike assholes like Joffrey, he doesn't consider himself too good to, you know, hang out with the common people and to do manual labor. No, Bran is, like, sociable and he's curious and he's friendly and he's helpful and he's humble, which is wonderful. I mean, those are great qualities for a leader and a ruler, right? I mean, this series constantly asks what makes someone a good ruler. And you see people like, uh, you know, John, um, and even, you know, Varys' uh, description of young Griff. He talks about, you know, humility um, and experience working with the common people. Being in touch with average people makes you a better ruler. Um, and so by seeing Bran, you know, hanging out with people, listening to common people, I think shows that he could be a great king if it does happen that Bran becomes the king of Westeros in the end of the books. Who knows? But yeah, he's just he's just such a lovable, likable character. And, and that's what, you know, the books emphasize a lot, that Bran is sort of the sweet, beloved, friendly character um, and and everyone loves him. And, and that makes it all the more tragic in the, in the TV show, especially when Bran becomes like a robot with no personality in the end. And I don't know if that's going to happen in the books. Like, I tend to think that 
Bran is a more interesting character when he has a personality, and so I tend not to think that he will be robbed of that like he was in the TV show. Uh, but certainly, you know, there will be a cost to Bran embracing magic, for sure. So it'll be really fascinating to see how Bran is impacted by gaining magic power and insight, and that's certainly part of what this chapter explores. Uh, so, you know, so we talk about, you know, Micken the, the, the smith and Alebelly the guard, and these are both characters who are soon going to die when Theon and his ironborn attack Winterfell. So George, as always, is establishing like an emotional relationship with these characters, humanizing these really minor side characters so that we really feel the loss when those characters die. George, George is so good at this. He sets them up, he knocks them down, he creates the emotional bond, and then he savagely murders these characters, which always never fails to have an emotional impact. He's, he, for the number of characters who die in these books, George is shockingly good at making us care about so many of them. It's a humanizing story. That's part of why I love it. Um, and yeah, Lewin, Maester Lewin, of course, also will die in this book. So but there's so much terrible loss and George really makes us feel it. Um, so Bran uh, finds out there's a letter from Rob in the south and he's excited to hear from his brother. Uh, and he's so excited that he doesn't wait around for Hodor to come and carry Bran up the steps. He instead lets the guard Alebelly to carry him up the steps. And Alebelly is a big guy. But he's not as strong as Hodor, so by the time they get to the top of the tower, Alebelly carries Bran up because Bran's legs are broken. Um, and so Alebelly's all red-faced and puffing. And later on, Osha carries Bran, and it says that Osha is much stronger than Alebelly, so she's not red-faced and puffing. So Alebelly Ale does not work out, is what that tells us. Alebelly is not a strong guy. The name Alebelly kind of gives that away. And that's and that reminds us that like you know Rob has taken all of the North's best warriors south, leaving randos like Alebelly, who while lovable, uh, are not the strongest, most capable warriors. So that's that's the sense of vulnerability, which which I think you know Theon senses and Ramsay senses and Wyman senses, and that's why all of these political operators and invaders swoop down and exploit the vulnerability of Winterfell very soon. Uh, so yeah, they go up to the tower and uh, Bran sees that Lewin is there and his brother Rickon is there and both Big Walder Frey and Little Walder Frey are there. So they are at Winterfell as wards of the Starks as part of the uh, supposed alliance between the Freys and the Starks. Um, so Lewin sends Alebelly away, and then Lewin says, My lords, he said gravely, we have had a message from his grace, Rob, with both good news and ill. He has won a great victory in the west, in the, in the Lannister lands. He defeated a Lannister army at a place called Oxcross and has taken several castles. He writes us from Ashmark, the stronghold of House Marbrand. And I kind of enjoy the, the comedy of this old wise maester talking to these four children, these tiny children, like, you know, Bran is nine and Rickon is four and the Walders are very young as well. But because of this feudal aristocratic world, uh, these, these children are lords and must be spoken to with utmost respect, um, which, which is kind of absurd. Uh, so... Rickon is like, oh, you know, is Rob coming home? Because poor four-year-old Rickon, all he wants is for his family to come back. Uh, but he doesn't, not, but but they do not. Um, and so Bran's like, oh, you know, so does that mean that Tywin Lannister was defeated and Rob can come home? And the maester is like, no, it was Stafford Lannister who was defeated and slain in the battle. And Bran says, uh, I've never even heard of Stafford, Stafford Lannister. And Big Walder says that Tywin is the only one who matters. So, you know, despite this hard-won victory where, you know, all these people have died, uh, it, it's not an end to the war. The war drags on, which is so sad. And it just makes you think, you know, Rickon is standing here saying, you know, when is my brother coming home? Think of all of the other men who died in this battle. Think of all the other soldiers who died. Think of their brothers. Think of their sons and their fathers and their wives and their daughters and all these people who will never get their their loved one home. George always reminds us of the cost of these battles and the tragedy 
of it. And I mean, even poor Stafford Lannister, like everyone's like, ah, he ain't shit. But I mean, even he has kids and, and siblings who care about him. Like like Davin Lannister is the son of Stafford. And Dav- we see Davin's perspective on his father's death. And he grows out his hair until he, you know, gets revenge on the on the Northmen and justice and so on. So, so you know, we always see that there are on flow effects and there are people who care about people. And there's a there's a tragedy to the war. Um, thank you for those uh, super chats from uh, Emmy and Lolotov and Caitlin and Saint and Pablo Reed. Uh, we will uh, address some more of the super chats towards the end. Uh, but thank you so much for your support. Um, next page. Rickon says, tell Rob I want him to come home. He can bring his wolf home too and mother and father. Of course, Ned is dead, uh, but sometimes Rickon forgets. He willfully forgets that his father is dead because he's so stubborn. So, again, so tragic that Rickon has lost his family and 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 has no prospect of getting him back. And he, he's just so young to handle this stuff. And, and, you know, I love the description of Rickon as stubborn. Because, of course, at this point in the books, stubborn Rickon is reportedly now on Skargos, the northern island of cannibals and unicorns. So I wonder, you know, how... How stubborn is Rickon going to be when he, you know, rolls into the Winds of Winter on Unicorn back, leading an army of Skargosi cannibals and wolves controlled by warg power to reclaim Winterfell, you know? I like, like, Wyman thinks that he's going to use Rickon to claim Winterfell for Stannis, but, like, Rickon, he's stubborn, he's strong, he's a warg, he's been through some stuff. He's going to eat Wyman. I want to see Rickon Stark eat Wyman. That's what I want to see in the Winds of Winter. Uh, so, you know, I mean, again, there's the whole problem of Rickon is too young because George Martin planned to age up his characters with, like, a five-year gap. So maybe four-year-old Rickon is too young to do the badass things that George intended for Rickon. But George did apparently tell uh, D&D, the showrunners of the TV show, don't cut Rickon because I have important plans for him. It was reported that, like, for a while, they were they were planning, early on, they were planning to not include Rickon in the Game of Thrones TV show. But George Martin said, nah, uh uh I have important plans. And I hope those important plans involve riding a unicorn and eating Wyman Mandalay. <laughs> uh, so Bran is happy that Rob has won this battle, but he's also disturbed because he remembers that Osha said the other day, uh, Osha said previously that Rob is marching the wrong way. So, like, at the back of Bran's mind is, you know, Osha's warning and the three-eyed crows warning that the White Walkers are the true threat. But the three-eyed crow said in Bran's dream, winter is coming. He showed him the heart of winter. Bran has seen the enemy on at least some subconscious level. And so he knows that all of this politics all of this war is a waste of life and they should be focusing on the white walkers so i'm sure that bran will play a key role in defeating the white walkers in the end whether that's through visions that reveal how to defeat the white walkers or if bran engages in some sort of magic green seer astral battle with the great other or with euron or something i think bran will play an important role Uh, and lewin says sadly no victory is without cost he turns to Big Walder and Little Walder and says, My lords, your uncle Stevron Frey was among those who lost their lives at Oxcross. Stevron took a wound in the battle and then died a few days later in his tent asleep. Which which right away, like, was, was he murdered? Like, he died in his tent while he was sleeping? Like, th- they say that the wound was not thought to be serious, but then he died later? And, you know, we hear later in this chapter that all of these Freys are trying to inherit the twins from uh, Walder Frey, Lord Walder Frey, the very, very old man who's in charge of the twins. Um, and so a lot of the Freys are, you know, positioning themselves to inherit the twins. And so there's, there's all this talk of murder between all the different people. So I wonder if people are trying to move up the line of succession by murdering Stevron, perhaps. Um, and Big Walder and Little Walder, they find out that their uncles are dead, and they uh, don't care. They have no grief. They have no sadness. Big Walder is like, eh, Stevron was very old. He was 56. He was always saying he was tired. And uh, I think it's funny because, you know, George Martin, when he published this book, he was 50 years old. 
George Martin was 50, writing, Ah, that man was so old. He was 56. He was always tired. So I wonder if, you know, George Martin is feeling his age when he was writing this line, and I'm sure he's feeling it all the more uh, in the year of our Lord 2024. Uh, and so Little Walder, yeah, he's saying that, ah, you know, everyone just wants uh, to move up the line of succession. And he says, ah, you know, who's the, who's the heir to the twins now? And Big Walder Frey, who's kind of the smarter one, says uh, Sir Ryman Frey is next in line to the twins. And then Edwin Frey, then Black Walder Frey, then P- Peter Pimple, and then Aegon Jinglebell, and then all his sons. Which is a little odd. Like, does Aegon Jinglebell Frey have sons? Like, he- he's this uh, quote-unquote uh, simple-minded fool who wears bells on his hat, who uh, 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 Catelyn kills him at the Red Wedding, I believe. Um, does he have sons? Sons of Jingle Bell? I don't think so. But, but yeah, the point is that Sir Ryman is next in line. Um, and then they're all arguing about, ah, oh, you know, Little Walder says, well, Ryman's pretty old too. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll die before he becomes Lord of the Twins. And then Big Walder Frey says, no, I will be Lord. I don't care about the line of succession. I will be the Lord of the Twins. Which means Big Walder is saying that he will either like, murder a whole bunch of Freys to take the twins, or Big Walder will just ignore the line of succession and stage a coup or something. Like, Big Walder has big political ambitions, and, uh, yeah, that's that's scary and dangerous. But later on in Book 5, um, Little Walder Frey gets murdered, um, and some people speculate that Big Walder might have murdered Little Walder. Um, so Big Walder's quite an interesting character, actually. Um, and yeah, th- this Frey succession plotline continues onwards, uh, like, you know, Ryman Frey is the heir, but then in book four we hear that Ryman Frey has been murdered by the Brotherhood Without Banners, possibly by Lady Stoneheart on her crusade of revenge, uh, for the Red Wedding. Uh, so after Ryman dies, Edwin Frey is the heir to the twins, and Edwin keeps saying that, uh, my- I'm pretty sure my brother Blackwalder is gonna try and kill me, because Blackwalder is this... Uh, nasty dude, and so a lot of people speculate that Black Walder will kill Edwin, but then Black Walder and the rest might be murdered at Davin Lannister's wedding, uh, because some people speculate that the Brotherhood and Stoneheart will slaughter a bunch of Freys. Like, in the TV show, it's Arya Stark who performs that particular uh, genocide, uh, but in the books, it looks like it might be the Brotherhood and Stoneheart who do it. So, so yeah, it's it's this funny ongoing plotline of the Freys being this incredibly just corrupt, treacherous, murderous, heartless house of despicable dimwits, and uh, it seems as though, like the Lannisters and like the Boltons, their their, lag- their, their legacy is likely to collapse. So I don't think we're going to see a Frey in charge of the twins at the end. Like, the twins are important. Like, it's the bridge that's at this critical location in order to get from the north to the south. Um, uh, The twins are an important place. It seems wrong for the treacherous Freys to remain in charge of that important place. So, so yeah, I suspect that the Freys may get their comeuppance. Um, I don't know if Arya will do it. I I think that Arya's wolf, Nymeria, and the wolf pack might be involved because they are in... Uh, the Riverlands, those wolves, so they might also be involved in some kind of vengeance against the Freys. But again, like, the the whole revenge storyline, you know, I don't think we should expect it to be, like, a good thing for the Freys to all be wiped out, because the whole point is, you know, violence is awful and don't be heartless and bloodthirsty, so it'll be really interesting, like, in the later books, like, the, the sort of balance between you know, justice, you know, for the bad people to get their comeuppance, but also not veering too hard into bloody revenge, which is what Stoneheart represents, the evil of bloody revenge, which is why I bloody hate it that in Game of Thrones, the TV show, the Hound went on this murder spree, which I think undercut the whole, you know, anti-violence, anti-revenge message of A Song of Ice and Fire, but anyway, we're getting off topic. That was a tangent. Okay, so let's get back to the second page. We are really tearing through this one. Uh, So, Maester Lewin is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Walders, uh, have some respect. Your uncle just died and you guys are gleefully speculating on who will die next. Like, god damn, kiddos. Like, button up. Shoot straight. Show some bloody emotional sensitivity. Uh, but, but no, Big and Little Walder are, uh, pretty awful. Um, and so then, uh, Osha carries Bran back down the stairs. So, 
remember in the previous brand chapter uh we got this little prophecy we got this green dream from jojen reed where jojen reed was like I, I had a vision of the future and in this vision uh there's a there's a supper there's a dinner and the big world of Frey and little world of Frey get served this nasty dead cut of meat of food but they like it while you are served this kingly royal slice of meat but you don't like it of course trust george martin to frame everything as a food description right um and so now this is the fulfillment of that prophecy because Bran gets good news. He gets the royal cut. He hears about Rob winning his victory um, at Oxcross, but ultimately Bran doesn't like this good news because uh, Rob has not won the war and he's not fighting the White Walkers, and Bran sort of knows instinctually that that is leading to um, bad things, you know, Rob's defeat ultimately. And the weakness of the North. While Big and Little Walder get this bad news about their uncle's death, but they're happy about it. So it fulfills the the supper meat prophecy thing. So uh, as we'll get into, this is about exploring and proving that, you know, dreams and prophecies come true in this world. Um, and so Bran's going downstairs with Osha, and Bran says, hey, so, you know, Bran's, Bran's noodling. He's having a noodle, and he's thinking, oh, yeah... Seems like the North is what we should be worried about here. You know, he remembers the three-eyed crow telling him the winter is coming. So so Bran says, hey, Osha, uh, do you know how to go north to the wall and beyond? And Osha says, well, yeah, it's easy to go north. Just uh, look for the ice dragon constellation and chase the blue star in the rider's eye. So, you know, Osha's talking about navigating by the stars, um which is, uh, that, that's a thing you can do. But isn't this interesting? The, the constellation of the ice dragon with the rider, with the blue eye. Uh, hmm? in, remember in the Game of Thrones TV show, uh, the White Walker, the Night King, rides a dragon, rides an undead zombie dragon, Viserion. So do you think that this constellation in the book of a blue-eyed rider on an, on an ice dragon maybe that foreshadows that the same thing will happen in the books. I think it is plausible that um, that a White Walker might steal Daenerys' dragon Viserion, or maybe Euron will steal the dragon using uh, the uh, the dragon binder horn. Perhaps Euron will be possessed by the Great Other, possessed by the Bloodstone Emperor. Like, Euron's doing this crazy magic sacrifice, you know, sacrificing, you know, calling up the God Hand so that Cthulhu can you know, walk him around and use him like a meat puppet, like a Muppet, like a Muppet puppet. That's, that's what I think is going to happen to Euron. He'll, he'll, be, he'll be a marionette on the strings of some stanky Stygian shitlord, you know? Um, so what am I saying? I'm saying that I think that Euron or the White Walkers might ride a zombie dragon. I think that's what I'm saying. But I've also, I've got blue star questions. I've got blue star questions. Um, are, are stars blue? I, I'm not like I'm not super knowledgeable about astronomy, but like stars are white, no? Um, planets can be different colors. Like you know, like Mars is red, and 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 Jupiter's kind of orange, and like st- like planets can be colors. So when we're talking about this blue star in the writer's eye, is that actually a star, or is that some kind of planet, or some kind of comet, or some kind of something? Like it's like the red comet is a thing. Uh, in this book, of course. And in George Martin's other works, there's other, like, ominous coloured lights in the sky that, you know, portend doom. Uh, like the EEC seed ship, the Plague Star, in George's tough voyaging stories, which, you know, brings, like, this seemingly supernatural evil and apocalypse to this this planet in the tough voyaging stories, um, which I think very much evokes the Red Comet in in this book. Man, I tell you, if if that if that hack Alt Shift X doesn't make a video about tough voyaging, I will, because tough voyaging is is super interesting. The only series that George Martin has ever finished is tough voyaging. Um, Sophia in the live chat says some stars are blue. Blue stars are a real astronomical concept. The hotter a star is, the bluer it is. Um, but like to the human eye, like I understand different stars can be different, but I mean, when you look up with your eyes at a starry sky, aren't the stars all like white to, to like the unaided eye? Like people in the live chat are saying that stars can be different colors. 
I thought I thought to the human eye they were basically all white, but maybe I've just maybe I'm just colorblind. Yeah. All right. I I might be mistaken there. I'm not I'm not a star expert, guys. I'm a dragon expert. I should stay in my lane. Okay. So Bran asks Asha about. So beyond the wall, is it true that there's giants out there and children of the forest and the White Walkers? Um, and Asha says, Yeah, I've seen giants and I have heard about the children of the forest. But the White Walkers, ooh, why do you want to know? Um, so that makes me wonder what Osha knows about White Walkers. Like, what do the wildlings in general know about White Walkers? Like, the fact that she's saying, oh, why do you want to know? Because earlier, Osha was talking about the White Walkers with, like, uh, Stiv and the other wildlings, and she was saying, like, oh, um, Mance thinks he'll fight the White Walkers, but he's a fool. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So I think by the way Osha talks... It sounds as though she may have encountered White Walkers. She knows how dangerous they are. Like, it, it's interesting, like, you know, it's always implied that the Wildlings know more about the White Walkers, but they don't tell us much. Like, Tormund talks about, oh, you know, the White Mist and our people wander off alone and then they never come back and I had to fight my own um, dead son. But, you know, it, like, Tormund doesn't describe fighting White Walkers specifically, only the, only the Whites, the zombies. So... I don't know, I'm curious exactly how much um, they've encountered each other. Uh, so, Osha takes Bran to his bedchamber, and then soon uh, Jojen and Mira Reed come in. And so Bran says, oh, hey, Jojen, uh, your prophecy came true, like your thing about the supper. Yeah, you were totally right. Um, it was... It came true with this news about the Battle of Oxcross. And uh, it wasn't a supper, though. It was, it was a letter, and we didn't eat it. We just heard the news. And so Jojen says, The green dreams take strange shapes sometimes. The truth of them is not always easy to understand. So that is one of the recurring things in the books, right? These books are full of dreams and prophecies and visions that foretell the future, but they almost always are abstract and symbolic and metaphorical, and it's really hard to know what they actually mean, and it's really hard to, like, act on them. Um, like, for example, Melisandre has this vision of a girl in grey coming to Winterfell, and she thinks that it's Arya Stark, but it turns out to be Alice Carstark, so it's not helpful <laughs> to John. Um, and, you know, in the Duncan Egg stories... Daeron Targaryen has a vision of Dunk with a slain dragon, and Daeron is worried that the dragon is him as a Targaryen, but it turns out to be, um, what's his face? Uh, Breakspear. Um, and Daemon Blackfire in the Mystery Knight has a vision of an egg hatching at White Walls, but it turns out to not be an actual dragon egg, it turns out to be Egg, Aegon V, embracing his Targaryen identity. Cersei misunderstands the Valonqar prophecy, thinking it's about Tyrion, when it might, when it might actually be about Jaime. So prophecies are always coming true in unexpected ways. Um, and one of the inspirations George Martin talks about in interviews is uh, in Macbeth by Shakespeare. There's this prophecy about how a king will be defeated when a forest, when the woods come to this hill. That is where he will be defeated. And so Macbeth is like, well, I, I'll be fine because forests can't walk around. Um, but uh, ultimately his enemies, you, they cut down trees and use the branches as camouflage. And then they go and attack him and defeat him. So the prophecy comes true in an unexpected way. So obviously, you know, it's a fun... It's a fun plot device. It's a fun way to, to toy with um, imagery and mystery and surprise and suspense. It's a good plot device. But I think in terms of like the thematic meaning of, you know, why are there all these prophecies that are always causing people's downfall? I, I think that it's partly this idea of, you know, the danger of ambition and the danger of having these great lofty hopes and dreams and ambitions that, that sometimes turn against you because, you know, these, these are stories about kings and magic and power and it's about, you know, reaching too far and too high and trying to push your own greatness and your own ideology and um, and um, getting getting defeated, getting hoist by your own p pataya. Um, so I think that's kind of what the dreams are about. It's about, like, the dangers of too much ambition and too much pride and you know, thinking that thinking that every prophecy means that you're the savior of the world, like, you know, um, like Rhaegar and like Stannis and like everyone else. And so I think that, you know, thinking differently about those dreams, thinking differently, differently about ambition and ego and personal power 
is going to be part of how the heroes like John and Daenerys and Bran are going to uh, do better um, in the in the final books. So Jojen's like, yeah, dream, dreams be weird. I mean, it's like how Daenerys says, why why must they always be in riddle riddles? What's what, what? She asks, what's the point of having a dream of the future if I can't avert it and if it can't help me if I can't understand it? And Mira says the same thing later on. Mira is like, what is the point of getting these terrible visions if we can't prevent them from happening? Jojen says, we can't prevent them from happening. Um, so why do we get these visions? And, and I think, you know, the reason why the, the old gods or R'hllor or these abstract mystical forces, the reason why they send these visions, or Bloodraven or Quaith or Euron or whoever's sending these, these, these dreams, I think the reason why they have these dreams is the same reason what, what Jojen's trying to do here. Jojen's trying to say, hey, Bran, look, my visions come true, therefore you should trust me and you should trust my visions and you should listen to my visions and do as I say. I think that that's part of why... Bran and, and Jojen are getting these visions is th those mystical forces are trying to manipulate them, you know? Like, the Three-Eyed Crow or the Old Gods or, you know, Quaith with Daenerys um, or Macquaro, like, that, they are giving people visions and Melisandre with Jon. Melisandre with Jon is explicitly trying to use her visions to convince Jon to trust him in order to make Jon do what she wants. So, and that's something George, George does lots in his past fiction as well dreams and visions and prophecies as a way to manipulate people. So I think we should always be skeptical uh, of, you know, when Bran and Jojen are getting these visions, if, if they're not actually helping Bran and Jojen, maybe they are actually a way for the old gods and Bloodraven to manipulate Bran and Jojen and to use them for their own goals. So I wonder if Bran may have to rebel against uh, the Three-Eyed Crow and the old gods and Bloodraven. So anyway, so Jojen's like, hey, so yeah, my supper dream came true. So will you listen to me now? Will you believe my words, no matter how strange they seem? Um, and again, like, I think it's kind of funny that, you know, George Martin's magic in this world, it, it's treated with a lot of like skepticism and evidence, like the characters in these stories need proof to believe in visions, which I, I think is quite like a sort of like skeptical, like atheistic view of magic, which is which is interesting, but it's like it's very much of its time, you know. Like I feel like people who believe in magic in the real world, uh, they they take it on faith, right? Like like magical people who believe in magic and 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 you know certain religious forces. It, it's not about proof and evidence; it's about faith. And I, I feel like in in some sense, it kind of misses the point of magic and religion when you make it all about evidence. Because if it's all about evidence and facts, then it's it's not really magic, is it? It's it's cause and effect, just like any natural forces. Um, but at the same time, like I guess George Martin is trying to sort of modernize magic for his readers in a way that it's understood. And of course, there are many characters in A Song of Ice and Fire who do take things on faith and magic. It's a really interesting uh, theme throughout the series, and this book specifically. I mean, the prologue of this book starts with this whole faith versus reason thing battle between Melisandre and Cresson, who represents the skepticism of the maesters. And at the end of this book, Lewin dies under a weirwood tree, which is the death of reason at the altar of magic, which, yeah, fantastic, interesting, evocative theme in this book, I think. Uh, so yeah, Jojen's like, do you believe me now? And so Bran says, okay, yep, I believe you. So Jojen says, okay, here's this horrible dream I had. I dreamed that the sea was lapping all around Winterfell, and waves crash over the walls of Winterfell and drown the people inside. Uh, Alebelly and uh, Micken and Septon Chael, they're going to drown, they're going to die when the ocean floods Winterfell. And so this is another one of those weird abstract prophecies, because the sea uh, crashing into Winterfell is actually a metaphor uh, for Theon leading the Ironborn in their attack on Winterfell, which will happen very soon. Uh, and, you know, since the Ironborn are, are people associated with the sea and ships, they are represented in the dream by water. Just as perhaps Bloodraven is represented in dreams as a three-eyed crow, and Bran is represented in dreams as a winged wolf. People seem to have sort of avatars and metaphors. Targaryens are often represented as dragons. Um, and so Bran's like, oh no, but like, how could the ocean come to Winterfell? The, the, the sea is hundreds of leagues away and Winterfell's walls are high. How could, how could the water be a problem? But yeah, it's a, it's a metaphor that is too hard to understand until it's too late. Uh, but Bran is like, oh no, we've got to warn Alebelly and Micken and Chael. We've got to, we've got to warn them not to drown. Um, 
and you know it's really wonderful that Bran's first thought is to protect his people you know that's why he's going to be a good ruler he cares about people and Jojen says no nah, like these people aren't going to listen they're not going to believe in our magic prophecies so um you know and, and I wonder if people's skepticism will change like the winds of winter you know we're told in a feast for crows that you know old powers stir and you know dark forces are rising and age for gods and heroes uh, this will be a magical time in the next couple, next couple of books. And so I wonder if people will become less skeptical of magic when they start to see it all around them. I, I wonder about the geography of it, because like in the TV show, the White Walkers don't make it further south than Winterfell. So for all the people in the south know, you know, they never saw a White Walker. Are they going to believe in White Walkers in the Game of Thrones show? Maybe no one will believe in magic. I mean, the dragons were there, but but everyone knows dragons were real in Westeros, so... So I wonder, like, will only the people in the far north get to see all of all this magical stuff? There is Euron coming in with his blood magic sacrifice in near near Old Town. So, you know, I wonder, will this be like a, a magical apocalypse all over Westeros, or only in certain places? And how will people react to the return of magic? So Jojen asks Bran to describe his dreams. So Bran says, I have wolf dreams where I run around in Summer's body and I hunt and I kill squirrels, and those are fun. But there are dreams where the three-eyed crow comes and tells me to fly, and we've seen some of those dreams. And Bran says, sometimes the tree is, on, is in those dreams as well, calling my name, and that frightens me. And Bran also has falling dreams. So there are these different kind of dreams, and we can piece together what they might be. So so the wolf dreams are, are Summer, Bran's dire wolf when he wargs into them, wolf dreams. Uh, the crow is the three-eyed crow who I've seen before. And most people, well, well the books tell us that the three-eyed crow is Brynden Rivers, Blood Raven, the guy in the cave in the north. Um, and the tree, presumably, is the old gods, um, the weirwood trees, the network of the souls of the dead that live on inside the white trees, calling Bran's name. So... Both the Three-Eyed Crow and the Old Gods seem to want to wake Bran's magic power and to use him to defeat the White Walkers. Uh, but there are fans who have different interpretations. Like, some fans argue that it's weird that Bloodraven doesn't know what the Three-Eyed Crow is when Bran meets Bloodraven. Uh, he says, oh, you're the Three-Eyed Crow, and Bloodraven's like, am I? <laughs> so... So some people argue that, oh, maybe the Three-Eyed Crow is actually the Old Gods, and the tree that Bran sees is actually... Blood Raven, because Blood Raven is more tree than man at this point. And, you know, I, I've spoken before about how I'm a bit skeptical of that reading, because both the Three Eyed Crow and the tree and Blood Raven all want Bran to come north and to learn magic. So, like, you know, if they all want the same thing, what, what, is there any meaningful distinction between the Three Eyed Crow and the tree? Like, if they want the same thing, what, what, it, does it matter whether Blood Raven or the Old Gods are, th are the Three Eyed Crow? But I do think we should be skeptical of the role of the old gods. Maybe they're using Bloodraven as a puppet. But again, like, Bloodraven is only interesting if he's a character who has his own, you know, will and motivations separate from the old gods, isn't he? You know? So we should definitely be skeptical of those forces. But I, I tend to think the Three-Eyed Crow is Bloodraven, personally. Um, it's just that he doesn't know he's a Three-Eyed Crow in the same way that Bran didn't know that he was the Winged Wolf and and so on. People have avatars in dreams that they don't necessarily have conscious awareness of. Uh, and so Bran has the... He's terrified of all these falling dreams from when he fell and he broke his legs. And it's like this terrible blow to his confidence because he, he, he never fell when he was climbing. He was so good at climbing. Um, but of course, he doesn't remember that Jamie pushed him from the tower. And the Three-Eyed Crow, like, deleted that memory from his brain in book one. So it, it, it's sort of awful how Bran is deprived of the truth of what caused him to fall, and it makes him question himself. And it, it seems awful the way the Three-Eyed Crow has manipulated his mind. And so, yeah, it's this horrible traumatic thing that Bran has to relive in his dreams. And Mira gives Bran a sympathetic uh, squeeze of his shoulder. Uh, and then Jojen says, Warg! They're going to call you demon, shape changer, beastling. That's what it's like to be a walk. So, you know, it, it, it's funny to me that, like, Mira is the one who does the sort of emotional labor of, like, looking after Bran's feelings, while Jojen is the one who's like, but magic, bro. Which is, like, a pretty common relationship dynamic, right? Like, you know, it, uh, there are lots of relationships where the woman does a lot of the emotional and the practical work while 
the men handle the higher mysteries. I, I think we all have seen some relationships like that. Um, and yeah, Mira and Jojen are a funny symbiotic relationship in that respect. Mira seems really hard done by, especially in the TV show, when she's dragging Bran around on that sled. Like, you know, and Jojen... I mean, Jojen is, like, physically weak um, because of his green sight, and he has those seizures in the TV show. But, my God, does Mira do a lot of work to keep these guys alive? Because she's, like, hunting to, like, feed them and and fighting to defend Jojen. I, I, I like the bit at the end of the TV show where Mira's like, Hey, Bran, like... My brother died for you. I dragged you, like, hundreds of miles through the wilderness. Can I get some, like, acknowledgement of that, please? And Bran's like, bye. <laughs> it's like, damn. Oof. Poor Mira. I hope Mira at least becomes, you know, the Lord of Greywater Watch. The, the leader, the Lady of Greywater Watch or something, at least. Because she's put in the goddamn hard yards for these magical, magical idiots, hasn't she? Uh, so Jojen's like, yeah, you're a warg, and some people are going to hate that. They're going to call you a beastling. They might try to kill you if they hear that you're a warg. And that's similar to how Jon uh, suffers discrimination and prejudice because he's a warg. You know, Janos says that he's a beastling, and Jon is not fit to live because he's a warg. And it's like how Tyrion is unfairly hated. So many of George's characters are unfairly despised, but they work to save the people anyway. And Bran says, oh, you know, I'm not a warg, I'm not evil, I'm not like that. Uh, but of course, you know, in the later books, Bran does, you know, Bran does skin change into Hodor and control Hodor, even though Hodor hates it. And, you know, he does cannibalism, you know, both through summer and in his human body, unknowingly. So uh, all, this, all these magical forces do lead Bran down a path of moral compromise and darkness. So, you know, you got to wonder, like, it's that question of, am I defined by what's in my blood? Uh, is Bran necessarily a nasty, violent beastling because he has the walk blood? Or can he choose to be moral and a good person? You know, it's the same stuff with Jon and his Targaryen blood. Is he defined by his blood or by his choices? And I think in the books, the message is you're defined by your choices. Uh, and Bran's like, no, I don't want to be a wolf monster. I want to be a knight. And, and Jojen says, a knight is what you want, but a warg is what you are. I think that the books are, a lot, it's a lot about accepting your nature. It's about accepting who you are, but trying to find the most, you know, moral, positive expression of your true self. I think that, you know, that's what it's like in life. Like they say that, you know, no one ever really changes, but we can be the best versions of ourselves that we can be. You can't change who you are. You'll always have the same sort of core, you know, strengths and weaknesses and personality and the same inclinations, the, some of the same patterns. But you can alter the, your behavior and alter the way that you express your core personality and feelings and behaviors to try to be the best version of yourself that you can. It, it sounds um, pat. It sounds cute. But I think it's really true. And I think that's something that the books reflect is, um, you know, the, the struggle to try and be the best version of yourself along with all of the flaws that you have. Trying to find trying to find a place where you can be useful. I mean, that's sort of what Sam Tarly is about. You know, Alistair can't change Sam into a warrior. Randall Tarly can't change Sam into a warrior. But Sam can find ways to use his strengths in a way that's useful and even more useful than being a warrior ever would have been. So I, th I think that's quite beautiful. Uh, so Jojen says, Bran, you've got to open your eye. You've got to open your third eye. You've got to awake your magic power and get control over it. But, you know, Bran is a nine-year-old boy and he doesn't quite understand those metaphysical metaphors. He cannot open his, his chakra root aura just yet. Uh, and Bran says, well, Lewin says there's nothing in dreams that a man need fear. But Jojen says there is. There's the past. There's the future. There's the truth. So I wonder, in later books, what, what fearful truths will Bran uncover? You know, will it be his abominable, war, cannibal nature within? Will he uncover Stark connections to the White Walkers? Like, are the Starks descended from White Walkers through the Night's King? Will, will there be sacrifices that he must make to save the world from the White Walkers? What, what truths will be unveiled? We get tiny hints of it in Bran's last chapter in Book 5. 
but there haven't been there haven't been any huge revelations yet. The the Hodor Willis revelation will presumably happen later on. Uh, George says that uh, that was taken from the books, so we'll see what happens. Um, so Bran just trying to open his third eye by like poking at his forehead, as though the third eye is like a physical thing uh, under your skin. But uh, yeah, he's he's struggling to do it. Uh, Bran is trying to save um, Alebelly and Micken and Chael from, from the sea coming in. And Micken and Chael don't listen. But Alebelly, the, uh, the guard who doesn't work out enough, uh, he's the only one who actually listens to Bran's warning. warning. So because uh, Bran said, oh, the water's going to come and drown you, Alebelly decides to stop bathing and he refuses to go near the well. And eventually Alebelly stinks so bad that six of the other guards have to throw him in a tub and scrub him raw, forcibly bathe him, while Alebelly screams that they're going to drown him like the frog boy had said. Which I think is so funny. Like, I think there's one of the most hilarious images in the books is, like, this grown-ass man, this guard, <laughs> being, like, held down, s- scrubbed down and soaped up in a bath by six of his mates who are, have, who have gotten sick of how rank ale belly smells without bathing. And I, I, feel, uh, I, I feel like we were robbed of this in the TV show. It would have been wonderful to include this. Um... And of course, you know, this wonderful little anecdote helps humanize Alebelly and makes us feel terrible when uh, Alebelly uh, dies in the Ironborn attack. So a few days later, Sir Roderick returns to Winterfell with a prisoner, a fleshy young man with fat lips and long hair who smelled like a privy, even worse than Alebelly had. He, he's more stinky than Alebelly. I think that we should... Um, I think we should do a stank tier list, like a tier list of the stinkiest characters in A Song of Ice and Fire. That's what the world needs. Um, and so th- this fleshy young man, we're told that this is Reek. And we're told that Reek was with Ramsay Bolton and helped him murder Lady Danella Hornwood. And uh, apparently uh, the bastard, Ramsay Snow, is now dead. Um, and they found just Reek, uh, who was raping someone uh, on the Hornwood lands. Uh, and so, oh no, rather, um, you know, Ramsay was raping someone on the Hornwood lands. So they killed him, and then they brought back Reek as a prisoner. But what actually has happened is that Ramsay, he was cornered by, by Roderick and the men, so Ramsay swapped places with Reek. This prisoner who they've brought to Winterfell is actually Ramsay in disguise as Reek. I wonder how he made himself smell that bad. Because Reek's whole thing is that Reek, like, smells terrible due to some just weird disease or something, condition that he has. Um, they talk about him trying to use perfume to hide it and so on. But anyway, yeah, so, so remember, that's what we were talking about with, with the Hornwood conflict. Ramsay Snow forcibly married Lady Danella Hornwood in order to steal her land. Um... And then Ramsay locked Danella Hornwood in a tower and starved her to death. And when Roderick found Danella Hornwood, she was dead. And her mouth was all bloody and her fingers were chewed off. Because Danella was so hungry and starving that she ate her own fingers. So, uh, my God, talk about tonal whiplash. We were just talking about Alebelly's frogman bath and now we've gone straight to uh murder and sexual assault but uh yeah that's that's what happened that's who we're dealing with with ramsey snow and so lewin and roderick talk about the political implications of all of this like you know since ramsey forcibly married danella hornwood and since she forced he forced her to sign a will naming ramsey as heir to hornwood like technically Ramsay can now inherit the lands of Hornwood, of the woman he just murdered. Um, and Lewin argues that vows made at sword point are not valid, but Roderick says, well, Roose Bolton's going to press this anyway, and, you know, Rob is not in the north. We don't have the Lord of Winterfell here, so it's really hard for us to assert our power and control this. So the Boltons are being opportunistic here, trying to snatch away the Hornwood land while the Starks are distracted. The Boltons are so incredibly evil. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting to see all that, like, politics happening, but it, it, it's also interesting seeing how Ramsay is a, is a trickster, because, of course, they don't include this bit in the TV show. Ramsay not only has stolen the Hornwood lands, but he escapes justice and escapes death 
by switching places with Reek and taking on this this false identity. So this is one of many tricks and deceptions and games that Ramsay plays. Um, and of course, in book five, Ramsay sends John the pink letter where he claims that Stannis is dead and he threatens John and he wants Arya back. And a lot of people speculate that, oh, the pink letter must have been written by someone else as a trap, like Mance or Melisandre or Moonboy wrote the pink letter. Um, but I tend to think that Ramsay wrote the pink letter and, and the deception is the content of the letter, not the authorship of the letter. Ramsay's a trickster, so I think that he lied about Stannis's death or lied about having Mance in a cage. And I think we're going to find out um, Ramsay's true intentions for the letter in the next book, in book six, The Winds of Winter. So yeah, Bran hears of all these horrible things going on on the Hornwood lands. I, I wonder how many reeks there have been, because you know the the reek was the was the friend, quote unquote, uh, of Ramsay. And uh, and after Reek's death, Ramsay makes Theon into a new reek. Reek becomes Theon's new name and new identity, and I wonder how many of these poor people who um, who Ramsay has tortured and manipulated and toyed with, how many Reeks have there been? And why is it why? I guess Reek might have been the first because he does, you know, he stinks because of his condition. So I guess it makes sense that he would be the first Reek. You know, the name fits. But a Reek by any other name would smell just as sweet. Okay, whatever. Um, so, you know, I, I think part of the message of this political stuff is that the system's broken. Like, if the Boltons can uh, successfully or, or semi-successfully steal the Hornwood lands by forcibly marrying Danella, forcing her to sign a will and then murdering her, then the laws of this system are corrupt. Like, like there's no way this should work, stealing someone's land like this. Um, but the way that, you know, the legitimacy and the wills and the marriages work, marriages are valid even if they're forcible. We see the same thing with Jane Poole and Ramsay. Yeah, this, this is only the, yeah, this is the first of two forcible marriages that Ramsay engages in, uh, in the books. So obviously this is an awful system where the rules need to be changed. And so I, I hope that Bran, having seen this, Bran might be able to reform some of those rules when he becomes the King of Winterfell towards the end. There's a reason why these things are happening in Bran's chapters. Bran's very young, but he does have political experience. So the Harvest Feast and through these Hornwood disputes, he, he's seeing and he's learning and he's remembering, and I hope that he'll be able to change things. So then uh, Lewin says, by the way, Bran, like, I'm dealing with these important political problems. What are you doing? You're telling Eelbelly not to wash? Like, what, the, <laughs> what is that about, Bran? And Bran says, oh, well, Jojen had a dream that the sea is coming to Winterfell and, and they're going to drown. And, um, and Lewin says, oh, you know, Bran, come on, I've told you, like, prophecies aren't, you know, real. But, because, you know, remember, Lewin, Lewin did study magic. Lewin kind of wants to believe in magic. So Lewin's like, well, it is true that there's been trouble along the stony shore on the western coast. All these raiders in longships attacking villages. The Ironborn are doing their little raids. And so, you know, Lewin's putting two and two together and he's like, oh, maybe the ocean, maybe the sea represents, you know, that threat. And Lewin is correct. Lewin is, Lu Lewin is correctly understanding part of the prophecy here. But he doesn't realize the degree of the threat, of course. He doesn't anticipate that Theon is going to attack Winterfell itself. Um, but Roderick says... Um, Roderick says, well, you know, if you saw Alebelly drowned and Micken and Chael, then, well, okay, I won't take Alebelly when we go and attack the raiders by the sea, so Alebelly will be safe. So so it's interesting that, you know, that Lewin and, Lewin and Roderick do listen to the prophecy, and they do sort of think, well, okay, if the sea is the threat, we won't take Alebelly to the sea. Like, they are entertaining the idea of dreams and magic being real, which which is cool. Um, it's more interesting than them completely dismissing it out of hand. And it shows that even when they do listen, it's still not possible to avert the tragedy. So again, what's the point? Um, J Jojen says, the things that I see in green dreams can't be changed. Like, these people will die in the sea at Winterfell. And so Mira says, why would the gods send a warning if we can't change what's going to happen? And as I said before, I, I think that the purpose is to prove their power and to manipulate you. I think I think the old gods and Bloodraven and Quaith, they send dreams 
to manipulate people, just as dreams are used in George Martin's sci-fi stories, like Seven Times Never Kill Man, and so on. Um, they are sometimes sinister forces. And Mira keeps saying, you know, we should fight against the dreams. And so I think the, the subtext here is that Jojen has dreamed of his death, and Mira wants Jojen to fight back and to resist and to try and survive, but Jojen has resigned himself to his fate, which is so sad and so tragic. And then Jojen reveals another dark dream, another prophecy. He says that, I saw you, Bran and Rickon, lying dead at the feet of this man Reek, and Reek was skinning off your faces with a long red blade. And then uh, Jojen says he sees Bran and Rickon in the Winterfell crypts, down in the dark with the dead. So it seems as though Jojen has dreamed of Bran and Rickon dying, being killed by Reek, and then being buried in the crypts. But as we find out later, what this actually means is that these two dead brothers are actually the Miller's boys. Because later on, Theon and Reek um, use the Miller's boys, they, they murder the Miller's boys, and, and burn their bodies and say that they are Bran and Rickon to try and prove that Bran and Rickon are dead. While in actuality, Bran and Rickon hide in the Winterfell crypts, not interred with the dead, but hiding in the crypts to survive the Ironborn attack on Winterfell. So it's so it's a really interesting play and subversion of um, of the dream and the prophecy thing, just like the Macbeth that George drink brings inspiration from. And I, and I think it's all also from an incident in the real historical Wars of the Roses, the princes in the tower who mysteriously disappeared. That's that's a real historical mystery that George Martin. Uh, draws inspiration to w inspiration from here with Brown and Rickon. Um, so yeah, all of that's cool. And and it does sort of beg the question, like, if Jojen believes that he saw Brown and Rickon dead, and he believes that the dreams can't be changed, why does he even bother coming to Winterfell and telling Brown and Rickon about this if they're just going to die? I guess he might have had that dream later after he already arrived at Winterfell. But yeah, you got to wonder, like, what exactly does Jojen think his purpose is? Like... Jojen eventually believes he must bring Bran north to the Three-Eyed Crow, but how, how long has that been his goal? And does Howland know? Like, I, a lot of people speculate that Howland might be in on it. Um, so, I wonder, like, what he thinks the plan is. Because Jojen seems to sort of drip-feed information to Bran a little bit. Jojen is older. Bran's only nine years old. It, it's a little nasty how Jojen and Mira drag this young crippled boy on this incredibly perilous journey to fulfill the wishes of mystical tree gods whose motives are only barely understood like <laughs> how how does anyone think this is a good idea it's only with Jojen's unshakable faith of a green seer it's only his sense of destiny that that he he th sees fit to make this happen which I guess is justified, because in the end, Bran probably will help defeat the White Walkers, but the cost. My god, the cost. I mean, taking away Bran's life. He wants to be a knight. He wants a wizard to fix his legs. He doesn't want to become a tree. It's sinister. It's it's coercive. It's manipulative, just like Bran's manipulation of Hodor. And it's it, magic is this dark, nasty path. And so, you know, and I think it, it's not just about magic, of course. It's about power. You know, power can be used for good, but... In a complex political world, it's incredibly hard to use power without overriding people's freedom, at the least, um, causing violence, you know, mass death at worst. It's the, you've got to thread a needle in order to use power well in a dark, complex world. Um, so, yeah, that's the end of the chapter with this dark prophecy about the deaths of Bran and Rickon. Um, and... And I, th I think this chapter's wonderful. I think it's a wonderful mix of, like, magic and, and destiny and prophecy and mysterious magical forces. It's, it's about politics, with the Boltons taking the Hornwood lands and Bran thinking about, you know, how to protect his people. And it's about, you know, human drama with Bran trying to protect the people he loves. Um, and also, like, you know, developing his friendship with... Jojen and with Mira and his enmity with Big Walder and Little Walder. It's also such an incredibly concise, dense and efficient chapter. Like it's only like eight pages or something, like seven pages. And George Martin covers a lot of ground. A lot of stuff goes on here. I mean, most of it is foreshadowing. 
Uh, but it really pays off with the Ironborn attack and Bran's survival and, and, and all of the Ramsey stuff. And, and my god, isn't it terrifying to have Ramsey inside Winterfell in disguise, no one knowing that it's him. I mean, he's he's in prison, he's in a cell, but my god, the things he's planning, the things he's thinking, now that we've seen what he's capable of, what he did to Danella Hornwood, so, so dark and so nasty, and the Starks seem so vulnerable. You have a strong sense of how vulnerable the Starks are with all the strength of the North down in the South. Um, and so all of this, I think, is setting Bran up as a king, as a ruler who cares about his people, and also as a sorcerer who, who grapples with magic and prophecy and, and all of it coming, all that power coming at a huge personal cost. So much loss in Bran's story of his family, of his friends, of his body, the trauma that he undergoes. What kind of king, what kind of green seer king will Bran become? So thank you so much for listening to this episode of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. Please press like and subscribe. You can subscribe to this podcast on any podcast app. There's a link in the description. You can also follow on Spotify. I will now uh, briefly respond to some super chats and donations through Streamlabs. Thank you so much for your donations. Um, and we will do this again sometime soon. So... Thank you for the donation from uh, Lolotov, who says George Martin writes children better than any author. Yeah, George Martin has said that Bran is the most difficult POV chapter for him to write, partly because Bran is so young. Because, yeah, like, it's really difficult for, for someone so young to grapple with all of these complex, weighty, political, magical issues. I mean, it's interesting how, you know, when we hear that Ramsay Snow was raping someone at Hornwood. Um, Bran says that he actually, like, Bran doesn't know what Ramsay was doing, but it seems to be something you did without your clothes. So, you know, Bran doesn't, Bran isn't told or doesn't understand everything about, about sex and some of the darker sides of human nature. And yet he's still in this position of power and he has to deal with these these horrible situations. And so, you know, you can see that George is really thinking about, you know, Bran as a child, what is his perspective on all of these events? Uh, thank you, Caitlin, who says this is amazing. Um, thank you, uh, Emmy, who says, oh, yeah. Thank you, St. Nave, who says, catching this live. hey -o. Thank you, Pablo, who says, excited to catch my first stream. Thank you, Marcus, who says, thank you for making these. They helped me get through COVID. Thank you, Sweaty Socks, who says, hey, Elf Shart X, out of all the fantasy and sci-fi stories out there, which setting has the best food? Good vids, by the way. Uh, I mean, doesn't Star Trek have, like, the magic microwave that can, like, make whatever food you want? That sounds pretty good. Um... I like any setting where you can, like, eat aliens and they're delicious, though. Like, I feel like, biologically, aliens probably aren't delicious, if I'm being honest, you know? They've probably got whole different kinds of proteins that we can't digest. You'd get terrible indigestion if you actually ate a quarian, uh, I, I suspect. But I like the fantasy stories where you can just eat, like, a, a globuloid from Pavilion 7 and they're actually like, mmm, lecker. That's a good time. Um, uh, thank you, Marcella Deliveria, who says, Always happy to give you some dosh, since I know you would never use mid-journey generated portraits, unlike that hack Alt-Shift-X. Yeah, I saw Alt-Shift-X used some AI-generated images in his Jon Snow video. Ethically questionable, if you ask me. I would never stoop to that level of moral evil as to use artificial intelligence. Yeah, look, I, it's going to be really interesting to see how this AI stuff develops. Like, I, I feel like we're very much at the beginnings of this new technology. And I think that it would be really great if we were having, like, really sort of thoughtful conversations about the ethics of AI images. Because I think that there are a lot of really, like, important and, and deep questions and conversations to be had about some of these AI tools, like... Midjourney and and um, Dali and ChatGPT and I, I think that all of that is incredibly powerful, incredibly transformative, incredibly scary technology in a lot of ways. And I think that we should be really thoughtful about how we use it. But the change is happening so quickly, and I think that a lot of the conversations around it are really like absolutist. Um, I, I I hope that we collectively 
can find a way to use that technology thoughtfully. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. I think it's early days. Thank you, MR, who says, I miss Raised by Wolves. Me too, MR. I really enjoyed Raised by Wolves. I think season two was maybe not as good as season one, but it was cancelled too soon. And I really hope that we get some kind of resolution to that story. Um, Aaron Guzikowski, like, give me a call. Like, I would love to talk to the creator of Raised by Wolves, Aaron Guzikowski. I would love to have a chat about Raised by Wolves, but, um, yeah, I, uh, I, we haven't heard much since it was cancelled. Thank you, Naku. What's your fave POV? Uh, Tyrion has great dialogue, and he has so much emotional depth. I, I think the Lannisters in general are my favourite characters. Kat says, my, if my life depends on remembering the difference between Big and Little Walder, I'm so dead. Yeah, it's really confusing because Big Walder is physically smaller and Little Walder is physically larger. Um, and Big Walder is the smarter one, while Little Walder is the one who's like more aligned with Ramsay and actually likes Ramsay. Um, and he's the one who gets murdered at Winterfell. But yeah, I forget it all the time as well. Uh, thank you, Jake, who says, love your work. Thank you, Birdcatcher, who says, get swifty. Thank you, Alexis, who says, I've heard you mention anime in these streams before. Have you seen Attack on Titan? I have not seen Attack on Titan, but I would like to, because a lot of people have told me it's great. Thank you, Curry Aficionado, who says, do you think the show injected modern politics a bit too much? The books are very nuanced about female empowerment in a patriarchal world. Case in point, Valamagulis. Yes, but we are not men. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that the way that the show handled, like, a feminist message was odd. Because in season seven, the, there was this moment where um, it was this war council of women at Dragonstone for Daenerys. And Alaria was there, and Yara was there, and the Queen of Thorns were there. And they were saying that, you know, weak men will not rule Westeros anymore. And the only men there were Theon, who doesn't have balls, and Grey Worm, who doesn't have balls. So, you know, they were really explicitly pushing this this female empowerment message. And, of course, the books are also about, like, the unfair exploitation and oppression of women and, like, people reacting to that, you know, characters like Cersei and like Brienne. Um, and, yeah, the show, like, in Season 7 had this sort of, like, heavy-handed, like, women power message. But then in Season 8... Um, well, yeah, season seven as well. Elena died. Daenerys went crazy and murdered everyone. Cersei died. Like, all the powerful women died, except for Sansa, who I think got power by, like, nasty manipulation that she inherited from Littlefinger and Ramsay. So so I, I, I don't know if the show even knew what its message was, like, vis-a-vis -vis female empowerment and stuff. Um I, I think it was sort of muddled in the show, whereas in the book, I, I think it takes a less heavy-handed and a more thoughtful approach. But of course, the books aren't, aren't done, so I'm sure that's one of many things that George Martin is grappling, grappling with. Thank you, Will Thimbleby. Thank you, Charlie, who says, I saw you mention in a live stream with Glidus, Del Toro Quest. Will you ever do a lore theory video on Del Toro Quest? I would love to do videos or something about the... Uh, the uh, children's fantasy series del toro request that would be a yeehaw good time i would love to do that thank you tired cpa suffering through u.s tax season uh love your work thank you cpa good luck at tax time firecaster says thank you for your ramblings xiao says thank you swifty will says how much for ale belly bath water Oh boy, as long as it's not reek bath water. I don't want to go anywhere near that. Stray Dog says, thanks for doing these. They mean a lot. Thank you, Stray Dog. Glad you enjoy them. Stannis McNuff says, will there be a thousandth Lord Commander of the Night's Watch? Who is it going to be? Uh, I think that's a great question. Like, it's interesting that Ed becomes the Lord Commander after John in the TV show, which would make Ed the 999th Lord Commander. I've seen some people speculate that uh, Jamie or Tyrion might become the 1,000th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. I think both of those would be appropriate. Or Jorah, since Jor wants wants Jorah to join the Night's Watch, that would be very appropriate. So, um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, McNuff asks, does new Susan, CEO of YouTube, 
pay you more if I watch the advert completely, or is it the same if I skip it after five seconds? Uh, I think that the YouTube advertising revenue system is deliberately opaque. Like, they don't tell you how it works, because if people knew exactly how it works, they would try to exploit it to make more money. Um, I, I will say that, like, ad advertising revenue is, a, is an inefficient way for people to make money. Um, it's more efficient, like better than YouTube ads is YouTube premium. If you get, if you buy the YouTube subscription, you get no ads and YouTube gets more money and the YouTuber gets more money. Like, like one view from someone who doesn't have YouTube premium is worth a lot less financially than someone who has YouTube premium watching. So that, so that's a good option. Of course, you know, probably the best option is Patreon or PayPal. Like if you just, if you give money directly to the creators that you love, that is way more efficient than ads and all of that stuff. Like, li like literally, if you give like five bucks on Patreon, that's worth more than many hundreds of, of views, right? So, honestly, like it makes the most sense in my opinion to use ad block because ads are really annoying. Um, so you use ad block and then you give money on Patreon to you know your ten or twenty favorite YouTubers, like however many YouTubers you like. If you just give your favorite YouTubers like a small amount of money and then use ad block and never see an ad again, everyone is better off, except the advertisers. But screw them. Uh, thank you, not Rick, who says no matter how many crazy theories people come up with, my favorite is that Howland Reed has the old crown of the Kings of Winter. Yeah, that's an interesting question, because Rob Stark has a new crown forged, doesn't he? Uh, I wonder if the old crown has some mystical function, maybe connected to the ancient secrets of House Stark and White Walkers, perhaps. It's interesting that the uh, Stark statues in the Winterfell crypts have these, like, iron crowns, and we're told that White Walkers hate iron, and so I wonder if it's meant to repel White Walkers or suppress the White Walker blood within the Stark Kings. Lots of interesting thoughts there. I mean, of course, Stoneheart has Rob Stark's crown, so I don't know if we need Rob's old crown and the original ancient crown. I don't know. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Astute Gargoyle, who says, your channel is getting me through grad school. Who is your favorite obscure Targaryen? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Who's my favorite obscure Targaryen? I mean, I think Aerion Brightflame is interesting because, you know, there's all this speculation about him being a sort of proto-Blackfire, which I find kind of fun. Um, but yeah, we'll be talking more about Targaryens when Hot D comes out. There's a trailer coming soon, I heard. Elliot says, do you think the show glamorized Tywin too much? We don't really see his war crimes and explore his flaws. He's just a genius. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people love Tywin. I think a lot of people really uh, are attracted to Tywin's uh, morally uncompromising daddy energy. Um, and of course, in the books, the whole point is that Tywin, you know, Tywin is powerful and to some degree charismatic, um, mostly through fear. But Tywin's a monster and Tywin's legacy collapses. His family collapses, uh, partly because of his evil and his uh, terrible parenting and all the awful he does while the moral and principled Ned Stark, his legacy lives on. So I think that, yeah, I think the show may have failed to sort of show us um, and emphasize Tywin's evil. But I mean, at the same time, like, th there's book readers who, who love Tywin as well. I think, I think some people just have, a, have an attraction to uh, strong authoritarian fathers. And I think that's a problem <laughs> in the world. People are attracted to strong male authoritarians, and uh, that uh, has been a problem historically and in present and in future. Thank you, John Ewan, who says, came here for the tangents. Uh, we, we, yeah, I mean, this was a uncharacteristically on-topic uh, uh, stream, but, you know, sometimes we just got to be a little efficient. Like, we can do these streams more often if they are a little more uh, efficient. Pablo says, uh, have you read Terry Pratchett? Yeah, I, I love Terry Pratchett. I've read A Discworld or two. I enjoy uh, Night's Watch. The, um, the Commander Vimes books are really fun, and Rincewind is really fun. Um, so yeah, I enjoy Terry Pratchett. Lady Atreides says, George writes women like real people. David and Dan, not so much. Yeah, I, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think David and Dan made bad choices with both male and female characters. But George Martin's line, yeah, is always that his approach to writing women is he thinks women are people, and so he just gives a female characters the same the same depth and the same thought as every other as male characters. And so um, there's there's a lot that George does right with his writing of women. Uh, though it should be noted that he also um, includes so much sexual assault uh, of women, including of, like, really young women. Like, even the stuff in Fire and Blood is weird, and, you know, that's a can of worms we won't open right now. But, uh, yeah, George is not a perfect writer, in my opinion. Elliot says, you talk about book themes. David and Dan, the Game of Thrones TV show showrunners, said that themes are for eight grade book reports. What do you think about this statement? Yeah, I mean... You can write a story in a really thoughtful way, being really conscious of what the themes are, um, or you can write in a more superficial way, just focusing on action and twists and surprises. And it's clear from interviews that David and Dan, in in writing the later seasons of Game of Thrones, they were mostly interested in action and shock and surprise. And I think that's part of why the later seasons were not good and are widely disliked. Like, I think stories are about something, wh- whether you are thoughtful and conscious of that or not. Uh, and I think that the decision to not put more thought into the themes of the story is part of why the later seasons feel empty and muddled and contradictory and arbitrary. George Martin obviously puts a lot of thought into the themes of A Song of Ice and Fire in terms of, like, power and morality and identity. That's what drives the books, and that's why the books are good, is because they explore those themes, giving the stories a sense of structure, a sense of meaning, a sense of consequence, as well as all of the wonderfully, like, deep and layered characters. So, I mean, you know, it's it's not easy to write as well as George Martin does. Most writers are not as good as George. Uncontroversial statement. But yeah, I, I think D&D uh, kneecapped themselves by, by, you know, refusing to consider what their story is about. That's what themes are. Like, themes are the topic of the story. Like, in anything deeper than the superficial, that, that's what a theme is. At least, at, least in my, at least in my understanding. And so, yeah, I, I think that D&D... Made poor choices. Zenith says, when can we get an hour-long Jon Snow x Saturn theory breakdown? Jon Snow x Saturn is not a theory, Zenith. It's a fact. Thank you, Zachary, who says, do you think uh, George is edging us with the mysterious blue winter rose posts? Yeah, on George R. R. Martin's official blog, he uses these really cute retro avatar images and emojis and little pictures at the start and end of his blog. So he'll write a blog about, ah, I had lunch today in New York and it was tasty. And then he'll have like an image of like a a weirwood tree and then a crow riding on the back of a of a of Flement Brax and then all the fans go crazy and they're like, what does it mean? And inevitably the fans interpret it as meaning, oh, he's telling us that the winds of winter is is coming according to this numerological prophecy it's coming you know it, it all becomes a little bit ancient aliens for me it all becomes a little bit q anon george martin has said that when the winds of winter is done he will tell us that it's done he, he has said that he won't play games i think george martin does play some games anyway uh because he can't help himself but i i don't think there are hidden prophecies in his uh blog posts or at least if there are i don't think we should pay attention to them because george does not know when the book is done even if george was trying to leave a secret message he would probably be wrong about when the winds of winter is done because he's been consistently done wrong every year in all of his predictions for two decades thank you truman thank you elliot um, who says that Danny is evil because she wanted to break the wheel. Yeah, again, like, like the show was really muddled in, like, it, it didn't explore the politics enough beneath the surface level. Like, in the books, the characters have political visions and goals and principles that guided their political decisions. Whereas in the, in the TV show, we just got these vague platitudes about Daenerys wants to break the wheel without ever telling us what that means. And so when Daenerys gives all these speeches and ends up getting killed by Jon, it's like we, we, we don't know enough to feel anything about these events. So I, I think George is going to have to think more, more deeply um, about it than, than D&D did, which is like it's going to have to be deeper than a goddamn puddle. Thank you, Nick, who says, when are we going to have a fight between you and Shift? 
Um, I'm going to challenge Shift to a rap battle, and uh, he's going down. All right, we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, Got to end it. Thank you so much for your uh, support. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you for the donations. I appreciate all of your support, and I'm so glad that you all are enjoying this series after all these years. Thank you so much. Thank you to moderator Schubert Reads. Shout out to Glidus in the live chat. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, ball boys. And we will see you next time. Cheers.